Good morning, afternoon and uh, evening, everyone. And very welcome to the webinar on restoration, creation and management of uh, salt marshes uh, and tidal flats. And thanks uh, for joining us today. My name is uh, Peter van Eyck. I'm uh, heading the Deltas and Coasts uh, program uh, in Wetlands International. And yeah, it's really exciting to see such a huge turnaround. I think uh, the counter is ticking, but we have more than 300 people on this call. People from all over the world, from all uh, different disciplines. And yeah, I think it's fantastic to see such a turnout. And it's also a testimony, testimony to the growing interest that we all have in conserving and restoring our coastal wetlands and then uh, salt marshes and tidal flats specifically. I think this turnout also shows the uh, interest that people have to access guidance and inform their work in a, in a better way. And also to learn from each other, to connect truly as a community of, uh, of different stakeholders um, and share what we know and build on each other's knowledge. The community that we are here with together is very diverse. We have people from across all continents and also people from all kinds of disciplines, from government, from NGOs, from academia. And I think that's exactly the community that we need in order to truly make a difference for coastal wetlands. The diversity of communities also represented in the panel that we have today um, with speakers from the Conservation Evidence Group from Cambridge University, the World Coastal Forum and my own organization, Wetlands International. I think it's uh, clear for all of us why we need coastal ecosystems, why we need to conserve but also restore in order to achieve our biodiversity conservation, our sustainable development and climate goals. Goals that are strongly founded in the global, uh, global conventions like CBD and UNFCCC and Ramsar, of course, uh, but also underlying efforts that we see happening to drive the large-scale restoration of the wetlands that we have lost. The UN Decade of Restoration of a good, is a good example of uh, an initiative that drives such restoration. But there's also other uh, partnerships that are emerging as we speak around salt marshes, the salt marsh breakthrough, for example, around seagrass, the seagrass breakthrough, about mangroves, the mangrove breakthrough, and then initiatives such as the World Coastal Forum that bring diverse communities together around different coastal ecosystems. But I think while the ambitions to do this conservation and restoration work are high, many of us struggle to translate large-scale ambition into action on the ground. There is a strong demand for better guidance so that we can take an evidence-based approach to doing our restoration work, but that we can also establish a space where we can learn from each other and build not just on the scientific insights, but also on the activities that we are implementing on the ground. And Wetlands International is very strongly committed to building such a learning environment. And we do that partly by contributing to the development of different guidelines and tools but also by facilitating the community to come together and exchange. With uh, partners united in the World Coastal Forum, we now have dedicated, developed dedicated guidance for uh, salt marshes and, uh, and mudflats. And yeah, that's what this webinar will be about. We will be hearing from different contributors to these different guidelines that we will be launching today um, about yeah, what can we learn from the projects that we have implemented so far on the ground? What does the science tell us? And how can we use these guidelines to uh, get uh, to action on the ground? So we will have different speakers coming up and we have also allocated some time for exchange and discussion. Um, and yeah, very keen to hear from you uh, what your own experience is and also what questions or observations you might have. Um, so my ask to the audience today is to try and be as participative as possible. We will be opening up the chat box. So please uh, bring your, uh, your observations and your questions in the chat. And yeah, without further ado, I would like to hand over to my colleague Bart Hagemeyer, who will be making the first presentation of today. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good day to all of you. Um, we're talking to quite many people, so many time zones as well. So apologies if I still uh, did not indicate your time zone. I'm very happy to see so many participants and uh, it's a great recognition of the importance of the habitats that we will be talking about. 
salt marshes and tidal flats. And um, maybe more than you even realize, um, we are looking at globally very important habitats. Next slide. Can I? Next slide. Because this is a map that shows how the tidal flats are distributed around the world. And you will notice that almost every continent, well, virtually every continent, is surrounded by some amount of tidal flats around the whole of the world. And if we look at a similar map for, for salt marshes, next slide, we will see that also these are found throughout the world on many of the fringes of the continents and therefore represent a very important coastal habitat. And it's not only us that recognize this, but also, next slide, the migratory shorebirds have found this and in their migrations, in their amazing journeys from the breeding grounds that are often far in the north to the places where they spend the non-breeding areas, further south, they visit these areas and they really depend on, on these habitats. Tidal marshes, tidal flats and salt marshes are extremely important habitats in the flyways of these birds and uh, make up areas that they cannot miss. Next slide. This is what it looks like. Clouds of uh, shorebirds flocking over these habitats and not only Birds use them, but also people very often make use of these ha uh, habitats and they provide both uh, income to people, but also recreation and uh, spiritual um, um, sources. So across the board for both people and biodiversity, these are very important habitats. Next slide. Peter already alluded to it, but in the vision of Wetlands International, which is all about making sure that wetlands are treasured for both their beauty, but also the, the importance and the support that they bring to society, these tidal flats and the other places that are important for the migratory birds play a very important role. As you can see, and there's a clip from our strategic intent on the right, we have set a global target for both ourselves, but also for all those that want to work with us to create a net gain of at least 10% in the area of tidal flats by the year 2030. And also for those places that are so important for these migratory water birds, we have set ourselves a target for those that want to work with us and ourselves of making sure that at least 50% of the estimated 7,000 critically important sites around the world um, are well managed and are in a favorable management status. And uh, many of those, as I tried to explain earlier, are tidal uh, flats and salt marshes. Now, Wetlands International is typically an organization that doesn't try to just do that by themselves, but we try to inspire and mobilize society to do this and to provide tools and support to those that want to join in restoring and conserving these habitats. And that is where uh, the today's launch comes in. Next slide. We launch guidance for the restoration and conservation of uh, tidal marshes and uh, tidal flats and salt marshes. And this is really coming from a project that we're doing currently in the Yellow Sea, which is called Flyway Bottleneck Yellow Sea, in which we really to better create better restoration, uh, better conservation for these migratory shorebirds that you see a very beautiful picture for, from at the bottom. Working with local government people uh, to tell them, show them and inspire them for the restoration of these habitats. The left top photo is in the Jiangsu coast of China, uh, Xiangku, where we look at the uh, top of the, the tidal flats that have been overgrown by Spartina. And here we are discussing how important it is that the restoration brings these flats back for as a habitat for, uh, for the shorebirds and for the, the gleaning of the people. Another example is in the top, in, in the, uh, top photo on the right, where during the World Coastal Forum meeting last year in September in uh, Yangcheng, we organized an interactive session and harvested 
the intelligence that exists amongst all the participants about lessons they have learned in restoration. What do they know about what went wrong, what went well, and how to document this? And all of this is captured in the guidance that we're launching today. Next slide. So here, I would like to hand over to my colleague, um, Lorenzo, who will take you further into an explanation of the journey towards this guidance. Thank you very much for your attendance. Hi, Ward. Thank you very much. And welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Lorenzo Gaffi, Senior Technical Officer at Wetlands International in the Netherlands. And yeah, as uh, anticipated by Ward, I'm going to talk a bit about the development of our guidance uh, for the restoration, the creation, the management of salt marshes and tidal flats. And I'll talk a bit behind, uh, I will talk a bit about the, the partnership and the context behind this work. Um, also mentioning some example of practical applications of this guidance. And maybe just before I jump into the uh, presentation, we said, uh, probably already mentioned before, but I would like to repeat, we have uh, some time for questions and comments at the end of the presentations. So please drop them in the Q&A box um, so we can compile them together at the end. Uh, <laughs> yes, so let, let me spend a few words about the partnership. Um, as I already mentioned by my colleagues, at Wetlands International, we are committed to the conservation of wetland ecosystems worldwide. And a key part of this work is empowering local stakeholders through practical science-based guidance. And to ensure that our recommendations are grounded in the latest and best available uh, evidence, we partner with the Conservation Evidence Group at Cambridge University. Their expertise and extensive database uh, were really vital in compiling the most up-to-date information on these habitats. Uh, both Wetlands International and uh, University of Cambridge are founding members of the World Coastal Forum, uh, a global platform that um, is uh, focused on the conservation of coastal ecosystems and helped us framing these guidelines in a broader international um, context for international for sorry for coastal conservation and we'll hear more about it from uh, Alec Jung will uh, tell us about the, the World Coastal Forum um, and I also would like to spend a few words to thank our uh, donor the Arcadia Foundation whose generous support made these initiatives uh, possible under the flyway bottleneck yellow sea project already mentioned by my colleague Ward just would like to add a, a few words on this. Um, this is an, an initiative that in China is implemented with the, with the Chinese government, uh, with the Academy of Forestry, Inventory and Planning, with the aim of strengthening wetland management to contribute to the restoration of important water bird sites and to promote the adoption of best practicing, uh, practices across the entire East Asian Australasian flyway. And this guidance was actually already launched in China uh, early this year. Uh, we gave them a preview uh, in, uh, in Chinese. The version in Chinese will be made available as well. Um, and it's already providing practical tools and inspiration for advancing the restoration and management of critical wetlands in the Yellow Sea. As I mentioned by word, uh, for example, for the creation of uh, roosting sites for migratory water birds um, and for providing uh, information, uh, providing options to deal with invasive species, uh, plant invasive species that are affecting the, the mudflats. Um, and what's especially important of this guidance is that is helping stakeholders to set specific measurable targets for uh, wetland conservation. Starting from the idea that achieving meaningful uh, restoration starts from defining clear specific objectives from the beginning, in our guidance we provide practical tools to help stakeholders to set these objectives. Uh, and we guide them through other essential stages 
that are also shown here on the slide. This is a, an extract from, from the guidance. Each of these steps are described one by one and uh, we provide tools, downloadable tools uh, to deal with these stages, like, such as uh, the monitoring, the adaptive management, and these tools ensure that the restoration isn't just about the physical implementation, but also about measuring the effectiveness of these um, efforts in restoring not only specific attributes, but really bringing back ecological functions. Now, although the project we uh, mentioned is implemented in Asia, our ultimate goals was to create guidance that can be applied on a global scale, wherever the salt marshes and uh, tidal flats are found. And this slide here highlights just how global our approach has been. Um, the map shows the diverse location from which uh, we gather data and insights. And this was just a few weeks after we started compiling data. Um, so if we would produce this map today, it would be much more fuller of uh, uh, red dots uh, that illustrate the geographical range of the information that shaped this guidance. And the purple dots that you see appearing now, um, they represent the location uh, of the uh, our advisory board members. These are leading experts from across the globe, spanning really like four continents, um, who contributed uh, to strengthen, to review uh, these guidance. Um, and just uh, one last point I would like to make here. Uh, we also understood that uh, about the, the importance of combining scientific knowledge with uh, expertise from practitioners working on the ground. Uh, their insight, these practitioners such as um, water engineers, for example, their insights really ensure that these guidelines are not just uh, theoretical, but actionable and effective in uh, the real world restoration efforts. Uh, in closing, yeah, I would like to encourage all of you to engage with these guidance, to apply them in your work, uh, share your feedback with us. And then I'd like to hand over the floor to Professor uh, Bill Sutherland, who has been a champion for the use of evidence-based uh, conservation. Uh, Bill, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo, and welcome to everyone. We're delighted by the interest in this uh, this work. The conservation evidence, we're obsessed with making conservation more effective. And the main way is by uh, finding ways of collating and making evidence available. Um, and we'd be horrified if you we went to a doctor and a doctor didn't use the up-to-date evidence. And yet it is clear that this is common in practice. You know, your doctor would get sacked if they used very old evidence, uh, old material, uh, and uh, and you suffered as a consequence. Um, and you can see the effectiveness of this. In, in medicine, they did an experiment whereby they had some wards that carried out standard medical practice. And it was good quality, you know, clever doctors who had, you know, had been trained and exchanged material, etc., and then they had another ward that used evidence-based medicine, whereby they looked up the evidence for effectiveness uh, when there was some doubt. And 19% fewer people died. There's 27% less time spent in hospitals. So there were clear, enormous gains. And it's very likely that there are considerable gains to be made from using evidence in conservation. Certainly, most weeks I come across things that could easily be improved. And medicine, uh, it encourages people to look at the evidence, but really what they largely do is they look at the guidance and it's the production of guidance that is critical. Uh, and, and guidance is used a lot in conservation. But Harriet Downey did a review a year or two ago in which she looked at 200 pieces of UK guidance, just the guidance she could find, and then looked at the evidence base. And the majority of them didn't quote evidence. Uh, and it was almost never was there a link between the action and the evidence. 
So you don't know, often they're just a set of recommendations, but you don't really know where they come from. So you don't know, is this based on a considerable body of evidence, on a particular study, on someone's experience, or just a thought as to what might be a good idea, all of which are acceptable, including just the thought, but you need to know which is which. You don't want to carry out a major project just because someone has had an idea and it's not been tested. So that is a really serious problem. So at conservation evidence, we've been collating the evidence at scale. We read well over a million paper titles in 17 different languages, and we extract all of that and summarize that. And we'd be doing that on coastal habitats. And then in this project, we've been taking that and then with the team, with and collaboration with Wetlands International uh, and with the World Coastal Forum, we've been pulling that together to say, well, this is what the evidence says. And then, as Vard and Lorenzo have mentioned, we've then been speaking to practitioners to evaluate that and assess that, and then provide their own experience as a set of case studies describing what people have actually done. So it's a mixture of the two. Uh, and then the next thing to do is to find ways of embedding tests into practice so that we will learn and we very much encourage the thinking of how can you test something in order to uh, see whether or not the practice works or compare two different variants. That's a particularly powerful technique in order that we can work out which is the better way of carrying something out. So um, uh, delighted by the guidance coming out and we're delighted that the, here's the Korean version uh, we've got a Chinese version, uh, and if people are interested in producing other versions, we're very happy to collaborate with them. And then the main challenge now is in getting it used, getting it embedded into practice. So we would like it to be unthinkable for conservation organisations to be carrying out practice and not reflect on the evidence in doing so. And I use that word reflect very carefully. We don't say you follow the guidance, you look at the guidance, you look at the evidence and you combine it with your values and your local knowledge and experience and then decide what to do. And it seems likely that as with the massive improvements in survival in medicine, that if we carried out more evidence-based practice in conservation, we would have greater survival of populations and species and habitats. So it's a massive win. And it just requires a transformation in practice and having more evidence available. So we hope and we're, we're delighted to collaborate with others that are interested in working with us in creating more guidance like this. And now um, I'd like to pass on to Vanessa uh, Vanessa is the person that's been responsible for pulling all of this together and very much led on the creation of the guidance. Over to you, Vanessa. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Vanessa. I work in the conservation evidence team, and I'm just going to give you a kind of quick overview of the content of the guidance and what you can expect to find in there. Uh, next slide, please. So the document that we've produced is a collection of smaller pieces of guidance. So these can be used individually or part of a series. So it kind of has this modular design. So in total, we have 14 pieces of guidance. Um, it's kind of like my guidance within guidance, like meta guidance. So this structure allows users to pick and choose sections based on their specific needs. So if you want an overview about restoration practices, you can read the entire document because it's it's all tied together with an introduction as well. However, if you've got a specific problem or you're interested in a specific management practice, then you can skip to the sections that you're interested in. So you don't have to read the whole thing to understand the individual sections. And the guidance itself is based on global evidence. And so we hope that this is gonna be useful to everyone worldwide. 
However, the conservation actions um, that we've chosen to place in the guidance have been selected based on their relevance to the Yellow Sea eco region around China and Korea. Uh, next slide. So I'll just give you a quick overview of each chapter. Um, so we have two pieces of guidance relating to planning. Firstly, on making evidence-based decisions for conservation management. So this kind of covers um, how evidence can be used to aid decision-making. So what Bill was just talking about now. And then we also have guidance on planning coastal restoration. So this includes a stepwise approach for restoring coastal habitats with an emphasis on setting targets. So setting clear targets will guide you to selecting the appropriate action. And so within the rest of the actions that we have written up, we've included an objective for those. Next slide. So there are five pieces of guidance relating to creating or restoring habitats. Firstly, facilitating tidal exchange. So this involves restoring tidal flow by, for example, removing coastal barriers and building them further inland, such as like manage realignment. We then have guidance on using sediment to restore or create salt marshes or tidal flats. So this includes using dredge sediment um, to create tidal flats. We also have guidance on reprofiling salt marshes and, in, and intertidal flats. So moving sediment around to mimic the natural topography and the structure of these habitats. And then we have two separate pieces of guidance on managing vegetation. One on tidal flats, which naturally have very little vegetation. So in those cases, you might want to remove vegetation such as mangroves. And then one on salt marshes, which are character characterized by having a lot of vegetation. And so you might want to be planting vegetation there or some methods also involve spreading plant material. Next slide. We then have three pieces of guidance on controlling Spartina. So this is um, quite specific to the area of the Yellow Sea where Spartina is um, invasive and has caused a lot of issues for these intertidal habitats. So guidance on chemical control, so what chemicals work best and the ways that they can be applied. Physical control, so different techniques that have been used to physically remove Spartina, such as uprooting, cutting or mowing or covering, and the equipment that might be needed. And also integrated approaches, so how can multiple methods be used together to control Spartina? Next slide, please. And finally, we have four pieces of guidance for managing shorebirds. So managing artificial ponds. This includes aquaculture ponds. How can they be managed in a way to support feeding and roosting shorebirds? Creating islands. So again, using dredge sediment to create islands um, as these provide valuable uh, refuge sites for roosting, nesting and foraging shorebirds. Managing vegetation. So how can we help manage vegetation to meet the requirements of different shorebirds? So for example, by creating open spaces for them to roost in. And also reducing disturbance, so ways in which disturbance can affect biodiversity and how can it be reduced, be reduced. For example, simple things like putting up signs or raising awareness. Next slide, please. So for most of the guidance documents, there's a set structure that's followed. So I'll just give you a quick overview of this. So they all start with an objective which is a concise statement of the outcome, the desired outcome of the intervention. We also include key definitions and a description of very brief intervention. And then we have a section about the evidence for the effects on biodiversity. So this is key to our evidence-based guidance, um, providing information about how the action impacts the biodiversity. And I'm gonna use the uh, controlling Spartina here, using chemicals as an example. Um, so evidence is largely drawn from the scientific literature, including the conservation evidence database that Bill mentioned. Um, but we we focused on three species groups, so birds, invertebrates, and vegetation. So in the Spartina example, the evidence focuses on how removing Spartina affects the native species. So does removing Spartina actually improve the area for birds and invertebrates and vegetation, as well as removing Spartina itself? And it's important to point out that we also include evidence, even if it shows that it might have a negative effect, because we want to be transparent with the user 
And in reality, sometimes things work in some cases and not in other cases. And that leads me on to the next section, which is factors that can affect outcomes. So this section lists some of the major factors that might influence the outcome of an intervention. For example, relating to the local context or how the intervention is actually applied. And so this section is really important for understanding how the action might work in your specific situation. So for example, if Spartina, um, if you have Spartina on your site, if it's distributed, the way it's distributed might affect what um, chemicals you use to remove it. So if it's mixed in with the native species, you might want to use quite a specific herbicide. Whereas if it's, if, it, if it's as large monospecific stands and it's not near native species, you could maybe use a broad spectrum herb herbicide instead. And then finally, we have a section about practical implementation. So how can you practically achieve the overall objective based on what studies and practitioners have done and what seemed to work? For example, what chemicals can you use and how can you apply them? For example, um, some people have tried using drones to apply um, chemicals or backpack spraying and just generally practical issues to consider when carrying out the intervention. We then also have a case study um, for some of these actions. Um, and this is just a real life example of the implementation of the intervention and its observed effects. So not all actions have this, but in this case, there's um, an example of where Spartina was removed in the USA using herbicide and the lessons that those people learned um, from that project. We then also um, link to other sources of information. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel here. So if there's other guidance um, that's really relevant, we'll point the, the reader in that direction. And we also try to provide links to all of our sources. Next slide, please. So the development of this guidance was really a collaborative effort. It's been reviewed by 15 advisors from seven countries including China, South Korea, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, the USA, and the Netherlands. And all of these people have expertise in some or all aspects of uh, salt marsh and tidal flat restoration. And this input has really ensured that the guidance is not only scientifically robust, but it's also grounded in real world experience and practice. Um, and this, we hope this global perspective makes it relevant for many different contexts um, and coastal ecosystems and, and be widely applicable. And also I know some of these advisors might, are listening now, so I would like to extend like big thank yous to all those people because I don't think the guidance would be where it was if it wasn't for this advisory board. Next slide, please. So just some final points. Um, future updates are possible. So this is a living, we like to see this as a living document. We've designed it in such a way that it can be modified easily and updated in the future. And we're calling this one version one for that reason. Um, and the modularity makes it easier to produce additional guidance and slot it in. For example, there might be some actions that you might think are missing from here, um, and it, but it wouldn't be a difficult thing to possibly write up a piece of guidance and slot it in without having to change the entire document. And you can use this QR code to, to access the guidance on the conservation evidence website. It's also available on the Wetlands International website as well. But here you can download the pieces of guidance separately as well as the full document. And I would like to thank all the people involved in this, including all the editors, authors, and advisors. And I will pass on to Alex, who's gonna introduce and talk a little bit about the World Coastal Forum. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all of you from all over the world. Uh, it's a, such a pleasure uh, to be here and present you about uh, the World Coastal Forum. My name is Alex Hai Jiang. I'm the Secretary General of uh, Eco Foundation Global, which is proudly serving as a co-facilitator to the World Coastal Forum's coordination group together with uh, Bird Life International. <clears throat> and we are very grateful that uh, colleagues from uh, Well International organizing such an important uh, semin uh, seminar, symposium, to introduce one of the first 
knowledge sharing products that uh, were the coastal forums task team on science and evidence, co led by Professor Sutherland, uh, Dr. Luan Hai, as well as Misha Jackson from Australia, Grace Rowe, um, which has uh, narrowed down uh, one of the few uh, knowledge sharing products to meeting the gap of uh, 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 this coastal conservation, restoration, and management. Uh, next, please. Uh, it's great to see such a, a wonderful turnout for today's uh, symposium. All of you are interested about or managing or care about the coastal wetlands. Um, send them to us. Uh, the World Coastal Forum, this idea, this concept was first introduced uh, back to 2017 when Philippine government was hosting the CMS COP. Uh, at the resolution 12.25, it clearly indicated that the coastal ecosystem is very complicated and uh, compared to, you know, ocean, forest, or even desert has been less started. And it's critically important to reach the harmony situation between man and the nature. So encourage to establish a World Coastal Forum platform. And this has been followed by um, CBD and the Ramsar's decision and resolution in 2018 as well as IUCN's uh, Marseille Congress, Resolution 30, all of which uh, has clearly indicated the importance of coastal wetlands, its ecosystem, and asking to building an international platform to strengthen the communication, knowledge sharing, as well as uh, multi-stakeholder participation, implementation on the ground. Together with Wella International and about 15 so-called shaper organizations, we started the work uh, during the COVID uh, in the second half of 2021 to establish the World Coastal Forum. Uh, a milestone uh, event was a hybrid uh, advisory meeting of uh, WCF back to January 2022. At that time, <clears throat> uh, 15 shapers introduced a document called World Coastal Forum uh, Initiative, a uh, document to establish the World Coastal Forum. And uh, we then have uh, participated in various uh, UN conference or uh, MEA's uh, COPS. And uh, November 2022, at uh, the opening ceremony of the Ramsar COP, President Xi Jinping of China announced uh, that China will support the convening of the Conference of the World Coastal Forum, followed by uh, Resolution 6, uh, 15.6, uh, adopted at uh, the Ramsar COP. Uh, in December 2022nd at the CBD COP15 phrase two, position 15 slash 13 on synergy, both have recognized the establishment process of the World Coastal Forum. And uh, we are very happy to introduce the first World Coastal Forum conference at the coastal city uh, of Yellow Sea for the Yenchen. Uh, in September 2023. It was a very successful uh, international participants from 34 countries. Over 1,000 participants have joined uh, the first World Coastal Forum Conference. And uh, this year's February at uh, CMS COP14, um, at the resolution 18.1, a statement introduced by Philippine delegation, further recognizing the establishment of World Coastal Forum and its partnership, and in which <clears throat> it's clearly uh, uh, recognizing the establishment of a World Coastal Forum, encouraged to engage in the World Coastal Forum as a mechanism to facilitate the synergistic delivery of commitments in relation to coastal ecosystem conservation and the restoration under CMS, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, CBD at its Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. 
Next. And I have just introduced that uh, the World Coastal Forum Partnership has been uh, introduced, uh, uh, started at the first conference, uh, September 2023. At that time, about 21 uh, founding partners, including Wella International, joined this partnership. And as of past September, uh, we now have 24 members in total. Um, 30, 37 members, percentage of members are actually from Europe, 25 from North America, 13, uh, 17 from Africa, 13% uh, from Asia, and uh, there are 8% from Oceania countries as well. And among that, 75% uh, are international organizations including Cambridge and other universities and research institutes, comes for about 12%. And besides China's uh, central and the local government, and we also have uh, some other countries, uh, government agencies joined as uh, partners, now uh, representing 13% of the partnership. And <clears throat> in the partnership documents, it has clearly stated five priority actions by 2030, including organizing the WCF conference on a biannual basis. So the next WCF conference will be held uh, in Yanchen City uh, at, uh, in 2025 in September. And uh, two of the priority actions are actually focusing on the uh, knowledge sharing products. One, we are very glad to see the first module of the Coastal Ecosystem Conservation Toolkit has just been introduced by Professor Sutherland and uh, Vanessa, uh, sponsor, supported by uh, Wella International on the soil mesh and mudflats uh, restoration, creation, and management. Our understanding uh, is this toolkit will be gradually introduced on a modular basis, uh, three to five modules per year. And we have secured uh, some fundings for continuous work on the toolkit. And uh, the second <clears throat> knowledge sharing products is on the State of World's Coastal Ecosystem Report that we intend to introduce the first version uh, in next year, September, when we're holding the second uh, conference. Uh, this work is co-led by China's National Marine Data and Information Services, as well as IUCN. Uh, in the most recent uh, uh, Asia uh, IUCN Regional Conservation Forum, we also hold meetings with uh, uh, the senior leaders from IUCN and uh, the uh, teams responsible for cooperating on this uh, coastal ecosystem report. And we reaffirmed uh, its timeline and uh, its uh, vision uh, teams and so on. I'm very glad to report we have also secured funding for this report and uh, we're looking forward to have contributors globally uh, to participate in this very important work. Uh, back to uh, September 2023, at the opening ceremony of the First World Coastal Forum, we also introduced a coastal call to action um, uh, to protect, conserve, sustainably manage, and restore coastal ecosystems. So we, we are very glad to see that uh, from last September to just now, the first module of the toolkit being introduced, and we are on the way to uh, develop more modules, as well as to introduce the Coastal Ecosystem Report by next September 2025. Next page, please. While we are preparing for this symposium, talking with colleagues from Wella International, some of the key members of the partnerships uh, and so on, we want to uh, introduce and also using this symposium as a way of invite participants to engage, to participate into the World Coastal Forum's priority actions that I have previously introduced some of them. 
We are very glad to see, um, you know, since 2017, when the Philippine government first introduced the idea, we now have successfully introduced the first conference and will hold the second conference uh, in 2025. The partnership with the multi-stakeholder uh, members is being established and uh, we are looking forward to continuously growing this partnership. The knowledge sharing products is being in, uh, introduced, the first module today, and we are on the way for more. And uh, in the capacity, uh, sorry, in the, in, the, in the initiative document of the partnership, one of the priority actions is focusing on capacity buildings. As Bill and uh, Vanessa has introduced, uh, this module is science and evidence based, and it needs lots of, uh, 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 coachings uh, from the authors' advisory boards to many of you who might understand from the frontier management bodies of many coastal wetlands. Um, so we are thinking about, together with Wella International and some other partners, to support a capacity building uh, on this um, uh, toolkit, the uh, first module and others to building, including through mentoring, exchange visits, site training, uh, networks of demonstration sites and other initiatives among important coastal areas. So taking these opportunities, we also want to call for nominations or self-nominations of the coastal wetlands sites managers and so on, if you want to participate in any of the capacity building initiatives through the WCF platform, together with uh, the toolkits, the modules, developers, and other partners uh, to develop the capacity building to help your sites using the, the first module to create, restore, and manage um, soil meshes and mudflats uh, in your region, in your area. Next page, please. <clears throat> Another priority actions uh, that demonstrate is to uh, on the uh, resource mobilization. We understand and also see from the chat, man, uh, the, many of you from different uh, world parts of the world, many of you from uh, global South countries, and we intend to working with our partners and also government and, uh, sponsors from Asian countries, from China and other parts of the world to provide the funding, small grants for helping you to implement based on uh, WCF's own knowledge sharing products like this guideline, the first guideline to be introduced uh, on the science and evidence to help you to uh, restore, manage or create the coastal wetlands in your country, in your regions. And uh, we are developing the idea of uh, World Coastal Forum Fund uh, together with some potential donor uh, to the fund. And uh, we also want to use this opportunity to call for um, support and uh, as well as initial group of uh, coastal wetland sites uh, interested on using this toolkit, the first module, and looking for some small fundings that uh, uh, after the symposium, this is a starting point. We want to work with you. We want to hear from you. And uh, we want to hopefully uh, at the WCF platform can mobilize some resources to help you to achieve your management uh, goal at your site. Next. <clears throat> uh, that's... Uh, my presentations, and uh, these are our uh, partners at the World Coastal Forum. And uh, this is an open platform. We're looking for any interested parties to join and uh, looking forward to have your contribution, your suggestion and advice. We have a website, worldcoastalforum.org. Everything is online and including the application to join. So um, I thank you very much for your time and your interest. I now give the floor back to Ward. Thank you very much, Alex, for this uh, 
uh, elaborate presentation around the World Coastal Forum. It is good to see that in the background, in the questions, there have already been questions about how can an organization join the World Coastal Forum? So I think after your closing slide where you provide uh, the way to do that and the website, you can expect some new uh, expressions of interest, which is great. Um, we have some minutes left, uh, seven to be exact, to go with you through a number of the questions that have been posed. Um, we have gathered all of the questions and those that we will not be able to address now at the end of this webinar, we will um, come back to and respond to later in a written format. So don't worry if your question is not selected, we have limited time, we will come back in written format to any of the questions that have been posed. There are a few that are um, relevant across the board and that might be uh, good to answer also because we have some expertise in the group that is still online here in the panel uh, for those things to be addressed. And one of those questions, for example, was about mangroves and tidal flats and um, why would we in some cases uh, manage vegetation also in terms of maybe taking some mangrove plants out uh, while mangroves are considered uh, a habitat that needs restoration in other places. Um, this is a, a very good question and one that uh, needs uh, careful attention. And we have a, a specialist amongst us that is dealing with this uh, on, a, on a daily basis, I would say. Peter van Eyck, who also introduced this webinar, um, deals a lot with these issues. And Peter, can I invite you to say a few words on that? Yes, thank you, Bart. And it sounds indeed very counterintuitive to start removing mangroves to do your coastal ecosystem conservation. But in some cases, actually, there is a very strong reason to do so. What we see in some geographies is that there is mangroves that have been introduced, but that have become invasive species. So, for example, in China, along the east coast, the species Sonoratia apatala has been introduced from South Asia to support restoration efforts. But that species doesn't belong there. Uh, is growing really well and has at a very rapid pace uh, been colonizing the tidal flats. So to get that invasive out of the landscape and maintain the tidal flats, uh, removing those mangroves is very important. What we also see is that in many cases, because mangrove restoration has become such a popular subject, people have, doing, have been doing their mangrove restoration in the wrong place, too low on the intertidal, for example. And they have been damaging quite severely uh, the mudflat habitats and the seagrass habitats on the lower side of the intertidal. Um, usually the mangroves that are planted in those sites die, but there might be instances where there is mangroves that, that kind of keep on growing in a stunted manner uh, that disturb the natural mudflat habitat that is supposed to be on that part of the intertidal. Um, and if you then want to do your, uh, your habitat uh, conservation in a sustainable manner and maintain or restore your mudflat removing um, your mangrove might be the way to go. So it is really important when you do your restoration, not just to zoom in into one single ecosystem, but really looking at the natural transition between different ecosystem types and really understand what kind of ecosystem can be restored at what specific place in the landscape. Thank you, uh, Bart, and over to you. Thank, thank you, Peter. And, um... There's much more that can be said about this. Uh, there is actually also a lot of documentation available around this. Uh, so I would uh, ask you to also consult, for example, the Wetlands International website and look for to plant or not to plant. That provides guidance around this dilemma. And we will also come back in a written way to your question. So where we will probably refer to additional resources on this. Another cross-cutting issue that came back in quite a few questions actually is the um, how can local communities um, ensure that they are not suffering the loss of livelihoods when um, wetlands are being restored? This is a generic issue, uh, a very important one. And um, maybe I can refer back also shortly to the words of Vanessa saying, this is not uh, guidance that tells you what to do. This provides you with evidence on where interventions can be done successfully and allows you to tweak them to the circumstances that you find in your particular situation. 
And that situation will always need to take into account what other stakeholders derive in terms of benefits from the places that you will be working in. Taking livelihood issues of local communities into account is a, is a basic condition for doing uh, good conservation and restoration. And please indeed always take that in consideration when you do this and use the guidance that we are launching today as a resource for you to help understand what interventions could be successful and how to tweak them to the needs and to the targets that you are setting. That is a very generic way of answering your questions. Maybe we can come back with a bit of more detail in the specific questions uh, and, and allow you and refer you to further resources where you can find more about this, um, this very important dilemma on uh, lo local livelihoods and conservation and restoration. Time is flying. I think there might be um, space or time for one more question question. Well, there are ones on uh, blue carbon. Um, what is the role of uh, the restoration of mudflats in uh, carbon economy, for example, is one way it was put. Another one uh, referred to how can carbon resources be uh, used as a beneficial argument for doing restoration. Indeed, also those arguments are very important to take into account. And um, although the guidance at the moment does not um, really address those issues in detail, it does give links to um, how you can take the bigger picture of all the benefits that wetlands provide into, into account and how uh, you can take work towards evidence that supports your, your interventions and uh, provide cases for future interventions. Um, we are approaching the uh, the clock at uh, the, the end of the webinar one very important question that was asked will there be a digital format uh, made available i hope by now that is clear to all several links have been posted on where you can download your version of the guidance and it is already available in a number of languages we will be working towards other uh, versions as well and um a few final words and maybe I know Alex you are going to say something about that was how can we make this uh, guidance land and make it work and how can we make it hit the ground um, do you have the last minute that you can spend on this it's only one minute but um, can you say something about that uh, yeah thank you Ward as I just want to first of all I saw uh, there are uh, curious and interest about WCF I provide the website online Please do contact all of us, including Tej Mondo, formerly with a Wella International BirdLife colleague, Nicola uh, Crawford, uh, International Crown Foundation's uh, um, uh, colleagues as well, Spike Millington. Uh, but as I said, we are not intend to develop as a, a top shop or negotiation platform. Our goal is to, uh, through science and evidence, the uh, knowledge sharing products, enable our partners to implement on the ground. So as you have seen or heard during this symposium, many sites are trying to uh, practice this already in mainland China. We are looking forward to support uh, more sites globally. And uh, if you are interested, please do let us know. And we are looking forward to forming a small groups to hear from you and to see how we can support you further both on the technology knowledge side, but as well as on the funding side. Thank you very much, Ward, for that. Thanks, Alex. And uh, unfortunately, we have reached the end of the hour that we had set aside to um, launch this guidance. Um, this is not the end. This is actually only the beginning of the use of this guidance, we hope. And you ho we hope you will all be able to find and get good access to it, be able to download it. And... We, as I promised, we will follow up on all the questions that you have brought to us through the chat box and through and, and that are now in the Q and A uh, box gathered. We will come back. So even if you have not yet received an answer to your question now, be sure that we will come back to you and hopefully we will see you making a great contribution to implementing this guidance. We can make it available. It's you and others, the implementers, the people that need to work with it, that need to make decisions, that can use it and make it hit the ground. 
Also, if you have new information and want to share that and think, why was this not addressed, contact us. This is a living document, as Vanessa said, and there will be future uh, updates of it. And therefore, any new information is welcome and uh, will also be part of the uh, conservation evidence that we are gathering to, to support uh, conservation and restoration of these important habitats. I think with that, the only thing that remains is to thank you all for joining us, giving us an hour of your time to listen uh, to our presentations. But first of all, to also now know where you can get the guidance, please bring it home, uh, use it and implement it and create impact for the conservation and restoration of these important wetlands out there. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.